Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Virginia farmers raise a lot of traditional row crops like soybeans and peanuts, corn, and cotton. But they also raise some very interesting specialty crops, including lavender. So what's the market for lavender, and what can you do with it? That's our focus on Ag Insights this week. We also have a story about a new license plate supporting Virginia FFA, plus Mark Viette will show us how to put some color in your farmhouse landscape. Those stories and more on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. The Virginia FFA Foundation recently announced a new way to support young people involved in agricultural education. The creation of a new FFA license plate was announced at the recent state FFA convention in Blacksburg. Officials say the plate will be available in 2018, that is, if enough people pre-register for the license plate this year. At least 1,000 orders are necessary for this new effort to be a success. More information can be found at the website supportffa.org. Well, of course, poultry production is the leading sector of Virginia agriculture, but not all chickens are found on farms. Raising a few hens in the backyard has become somewhat popular in Virginia. Families, especially those with young children, like the benefits of backyard poultry flocks. Who could argue with fresh eggs every day? plus free fertilizer for your garden. But before you run out and purchase a few chicks and start building a hen house, you need to check with local authorities to make sure that backyard poultry is allowed in your area. That's according to subject matter expert, Lisa Steele. The very first thing you need to do is check with your town. Find out if you can have chickens, if there's a limit to how many you can have, if you can have roosters, sometimes you need a permit for a coop. You might need to have the coop a certain number of feet away from your property lines, just all kinds of things like that. Steele is the author of three books on the topic of backyard poultry and says, having a small flock of hens is a good project for children. It really is. I think, I mean, they're so small that for small kids, it's easier than like a, a goat or a cow or something. You know, they can fill feeders, they can fill waterers, they can collect eggs, of course. I mean, I had chickens as a kid, so yeah, it's definitely a good family, family pet kind of thing. The term biosecurity is often used with commercial poultry flocks, but Steele says it's just as important with backyard birds. I think something people don't realize about chickens that you don't find in another pet, like a cat or a dog or a bunny, is that there's a lot of infectious diseases that can pass from flock to flock. So if you do have a friend or neighbor who has chickens, you don't necessarily want to be visiting back and forth. You don't want to be swapping egg cartons or waters or feeders because what your flock has in it, they might be immune to, but if you bring it into their flock, their flock might have problems with it. More information about raising backyard poultry can be found at Steele's website, fresheggsdaily.com. People can also read any of her three books or, of course, contact their local office of Virginia Cooperative Extension. People considering a backyard flock, they should also think about limiting their birds to hens. Uh, roosters can be very loud, especially in a city neighborhood. A new chapter of the Farmer Veteran Coalition is expected to be established in Virginia in the near future. Officials with the nonprofit organization say they believe that military veterans make ideal candidates to be involved in agriculture. One of the efforts of the organization will be a new campaign called Homegrown by Heroes, which will become a part of the Virginia Grown Labeling Program. The Virginia chapter of the Farmer Veteran Coalition has been recognized by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and it is expected to be formed later this summer. Information can be found at the website farmvetco.org. Well, crop conditions continue to look good in early July, thanks to 
favorable growing conditions in spring and early summer, Virginia farmers who grow corn, soybeans, peanuts, and cotton, they report generally good field conditions with mostly adequate soil moisture. Uh, many farmers say their first cutting of hay back in May and June provided good yields with excellent quality hay. Turning to tree fruit, there appears to be, however, some concern amongst orchards and grape vineyards as populations of Japanese beetles seem to be a bit high in some areas. We should nevertheless say that a good supply of peaches, apples, and wine grapes from Virginia orchards and vineyards this summer and fall should be available. Numerous Virginia farmers are finding success on small parcels of land, and they're doing so by raising specialty crops. That's our focus on Ag Insights with Amy Rocher, coming up next. Today we're in Cross Keys, Virginia, and we're visiting White Oak Lavender Farm. I'm joined by owner and CEO, Julie Househalter. Julie, thank you so much for having us out today. Oh, thank you for coming to the Lavender Farm on such a beautiful day. This is absolutely gorgeous. And this is one day I really wish that we had smell-o-vision because it <laughs> smells so wonderful out here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about White Oak Lavender. How long have you been here? Sure, White Oak Lavender has been in business for about seven years that we have had people coming to the farm. The first thing that we always tell everyone when they come to the farm is that you just need to take a deep breath and relax. And it, it's not overpowering, it's just, it's, it's lovely. It really is. Thank you. Now, what made you say, hey, let's start a lavender farm? Well, well Amy, you know, there's a lot that's going on in the world that's really stressful. There's a lot of bad things that happen in the world that really are uh, happening because people don't know how to manage their anxiety. And in my career, uh, that's what I've done for a living, is work with a lot of folks that have some anxiety problems. So I always tell people along the way that as a farmer, I didn't search for lavender. Lavender found me. How much of your farm did you decide to give over to the lavender? Well, our uh, farm actually is a historical farm. Uh, it was founded in 1901. And so primarily had been cattle and horses and hay throughout the years. And so after uh, my husband and I purchased the working part of this farm about 10 years ago, we decided that we would start growing um, herbs and we were growing herbs for Shenandoah growers. After that is when I sort of discovered the lavender industry and decided to grow some test rows. I was told by lavender farmers all around the United States that if I didn't lose more than 10% of my crop in a winter time, I was doing great and I never did lose that much. And so I just kept planting and now it's hobby gone wild. Wow, I'd say it's gone wild. This, look at this, all this <laughs> lavender around us. It's absolutely stunning. Yeah, we grow about 9,000 lavender plants in about 30 different varieties on the farm in order to make over 100 products that we market to our visitors. 100 products. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Okay. I wanna talk a little bit about the plant itself. Yeah. What is your growing season and when do you harvest? Good question. Um, lavender is a woody shrub, so it stays in the ground for about 20 years. It goes dormant in the winter time, but in the, scre in the spring it starts to green up again. And you can see that around um, May to June and July it starts um, blooming, all of these beautiful, beautiful blooms. It comes in white and pinks and different shades of purple. The different varieties of lavender actually come into bloom at different times, and that's when we begin to harvest. We're actually harvesting for this bud that's on the stem. We use the bud and not the leaf of this particular plant. So when we harvest the lavender, we're using it for two things. One is that we are drying the lavender in order to take the little buds um, off of the stem so that we can use them in our spa products that we sew and in our cooking products. Then when the lavender is just fresh in the ground, we have to harvest it and take the fresh lavender to the distillery and steam it in order to get the essential oils. Most of our bath and body products are made with lavender essential oil or the fluorosol. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a distillery here on site that you make your products with. Will you show us that? I'd love to show it to you. Yes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Julie, so here we are at your distillery. Yeah. Tell us what happens here. So when we harvest the lavender, 
uh, we bring it fresh here to the distillery. There are lots of ways that you can extract the essential oils and the hydrosol from a plant, but we want to do it the cleanest way possible because we're making aromatherapy items and bath and body products. And so we're going to use steam distillation. It is very clean, it leaves no residual at all in the oils, and it doesn't damage the earth a bit. And so what we do is that we fill a whole hopper full of our lavender flower buds, and we bring this hopper and we put it into this tank. And you can see that the tank is just a bit longer than the hopper. Yes. That's because there's water in the bottom of the tank and we're going to boil the water. It causes the steam to pass up through the lavender that's in the hopper basket and the steam causes the lavender to sweat and it sweats from its oil glands. And so those little droplets of oil are going to rise up through this distillery system until they come to this big copper circle here, which is the condenser. In the condenser, when the steam is pushed into that, it begins to cool. And when a steam begins to cool, it turns back into a liquid. So that liquid begins to drip right here into this box. This box is very special. It's called a separator or an essencer. That's where the essential oil is beginning to separate from the hydrosol. The pressure begins to push it up this little graduated cylinder, and this is what we get. We get a lavender essential oil, and we get a hydrosol. The lavender oil is always going to be lighter than the water, so it's going to sit on top of the graduated cylinder. It rolls over the top and comes down into the spigot and we just tap it off into glass and we take the hydrosol and siphon it off into big jugs. Well, I think it's interesting um, to see this. You talked about how clean it is. I mean, this is completely see-through. I don't see any, there's nothing floating around in that and even the water that comes off. Absolutely, yeah, but yet it is full of just wonderful healing properties that lavender is so known for. Right. Depending on the variety of lavender that we might be distilling, it can be anywhere from clear to a very light gold to this Melissa, which caused a beautiful deep golden essential oil. So it's each of the beautiful. lavender varieties produces its own unique essential oil that has a specific scent and a color. So let's talk about some of the items that you make using the lavender oil. Oh, goodness. First of all, we bottle it directly. We retail just the essential oil in two different varieties that we offer here at our farm. Uh, and then we also bottle directly the hydrosol. We sell it as a linen spray. It's beautiful. It's a distilled water, so you can put it in your iron. It's lovely oh, to wow. put on all of your linens. People also buy it for an aromatherapy mist. You can just spray it in the air and breathe it in for the relaxing properties. And that's the water? That's the hydrosol, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. The lavender essential oil we just use by the drop. Lavender essential oil is very, very concentrated. One drop of essential oil can be equal to about 30 cups of tea if we were to steep the lavender flower buds. Oh my and goodness. so we only are using it by the drop and we're making soaps and lotions and creams and massage oils and lots of lovely, lovely bath oils and other spa products. Your gift shop here on the farm is loaded full of all kinds of things made with lavender and it's absolutely amazing and all those are made here. They are, yeah. The sky's the limit of all the things that you can think of of what we might add lavender to. And so many of those things we make right from scratch, buying butters that we can blend with the lavender essential oils and lotions and creams and some of the things that we buy a base and we go to our most organic natural sources that we can find for some of those cosmetic bases. Well, I saw a sign in your gift shop that said lavender ice cream. Oh, it's wonderful. Really? <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. even imagine the flavor with ice cream. <laughs> Tell us how that came about. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. So, so many of the ice cream flavors are now becoming sort of boutique flavors. And we actually went to the creamery with this idea. And they also were surprised. They thought lavender in the ice cream? So we now do a blueberry lavender, a strawberry lavender, and a vanilla. And in the fall we do a apple pie lavender. <laughs> Oh, it's that sounds just wonderful. delicious. It's just delicious, yeah. And it's really good for you, too. Great. Well, now, you mentioned the, the drying house. Yes. Can, uh -huh. can you take us there and show us what it's all about? Absolutely. We actually had Community Harvest Day just yesterday, and so the drying barn is full. Let's go see it. Great. Thanks. <laughs> so we've made it to the drying and debutting barn. Obviously, we've got a lot of hanging plants in here. Tell, tell us what happens in here. Absolutely. When we harvest the lavender all season long, we're bringing it here to the barn because we need it to dry. And so we've designed these racks to put each of the bundles uh, on, and it stays in here for about a week to 10 days. And then we need to take the buds off of all of these stems, so we do debudding.
none of this will be distilled because the buds are distilled for the oil and the water when they're fresh. That's correct. With our big farm distillery, we are only using fresh lavender. We could distill some dried bud in some of the small stills that we use, but not for any of our production. Okay, so all these buds are hanging in here. How do you get the buds off of their stems? Absolutely. So often things are done manually on a lavender farm. Uh, and so it might be that we take a bucket and we simply roll the lavender, all the bundles just like this. And you can see how quickly all of the buds come off of the stem. Oh, so goodness. this is one way that we can debud the lavender. However, recently uh, we've been using a machine. Okay. Yeah, the debudding machine uh, basically uses the same principle. We have a vacuum cleaner brush that we're able to just s gently glide each bundle in against the vacuum cleaner brush, and it gently beats the buds right off of the stem, and we end okay. up with just an empty bundle. Now, something that I thought was interesting that you and I talked about earlier was that lavender is a natural insect repellent. Yeah. Tell mm -hmm. us some of the ways it's used for insect repelling? Well, sure. Um, so sometimes people will use the lavender buds themselves. They might make a little pouch or things. Mm -hmm. They're going to put it in with their woolens. It's great for repelling moths. Okay. That's something that the colonists started when they first settled our country. Sure. However, we have also learned that there's a lot of oil in the stem itself. And so this is a byproduct of the lavender. The buds are very valuable to us in other ways. And so we can chop the stem up and even put it in with our chicken litter and just keep the insects out of the, out of the litter for the chickens. Wow. Yeah. Okay. We're trying to try to learn how to use every little bit of the lavender plant. That's wonderful. Well, we have one more stop to make. We're going to go up to the gazebo and kind of get a, an overview of the whole farm. Oh, we look forward to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we are on top of the hill overlooking the discovery area. It's so pretty up here and there's so many different little sections you have on the whole farm. What can people expect to see and do when they visit White Oak Lavender Farm? Oh, Amy, we try to have a little something for everybody. We want both men, women, older people, uh, and children to enjoy our farm. When families come to the farm, there's so much that they can do out here in the discovery area. We have everything from the life-size checkerboard and life-size Jenga and games that children can play outdoors to a very contemplative labyrinth walk. Many people love to come to the Lavender Farm because they might have a big decision to make in their life and they want to get just in the quiet of the gardens. We also have you pick. People just enjoy so much during season to come out and pick their own lavender that they can dry and then have their lavender to use all winter. Uh, we also um, offer many tours and classes here at the farm. So during the season from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we have a daily tour one hour after opening. So this tour that you give every day what are some of the highlights of it? Because this is really a historical area that we're sitting on. It is. White Oak Lavender Farm sits on historical battleground from the Civil War era. And uh, not too long after the war, uh, this was all taken down for farming. So for me to have lavender growing on something that is war-torn property is very, very meaningful. So on the daily tour, we often tell a little bit about the history. We show the distilling demonstration, and of course, people learn all about the lavender and how to process it too. Okay. Well, if our viewers would like to have more information about White Oak Lavender Farm, where should they go? Oh, our webpage at www.whiteoaklavender.com. There you can read all about the events and the classes and the ongoing things that are happening at the farm. You also can see what flavors, are, flavors of lavender ice cream we have that week. <laughs> I can't wait to try it. Yeah. Julie, thank you so much for having us out here today. It's been so enjoyable. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, we had a perfect day for your visit. We really did. And now I'm going to try your... Lavender blueberry. Absolutely. I have lavender vanilla. If people want to check our webpage at www.whiteoaklavender.com, you can see what vanilla, what flavors of the day that we might be carrying. That's delicious. <laughs> Glad that you is like delicious. It. Thanks Isn't again. Good? Yeah. You're welcome. We'll be right back. Well, this week we take a look at putting some color in your farmhouse landscape. Mark Viette shows us how as we go in the garden. You can find color in the spring, summer, fall, even in the winter. And around the time that your viburnums come into bloom with that 
beautiful fragrance. There are some other plants that you can plant around them, and that includes the Lenten Rose, Christmas Rose, or Helleborus. And this one here is just beautiful, which is known as Pink Frost, with the beautiful dark foliage. There's another variety right here known as Winter's Bliss. And just look at the color and brightness you can have. Now these are bright shade plants and they're long lived. Some of them recede year after year. In addition to the spring blooming Helleborus, you've got the great pulmonarias. They're also known as lungworts because uh, they have spots on the leaves. And these plants I've just talked about here, uh, the Helleborus especially, is a great deer resistant plant. I almost call it deer proof, so it has other advantages, but it's a great ground cover plant, all of these, to give you some of that spring color at the same time, that beautiful fragrant viburnum blooms. Color can be added to the garden in a variety of ways. One way is to use foliage, and foliage can change. You know, you've got blue spruce, then you've also got some of your arborvitaes, and during the winter months, your arborvitaes are gonna change to a darker color, and then you've got very soft textures. So when you're looking in the garden, add some of these things, and with foliage that brighten up some of those places. It is important that you give your evergreens plenty of room. Some of these are dwarf, some won't get big, but some of these evergreens can get 40 feet tall. One of my favorite evergreens to use instead of Leyland Cypress is the Gold Rider Leyland Cypress. And this is a great plant and it gets only about 15 to 20 feet tall and maybe only 15 feet wide, as opposed to 40 feet by 30 feet. So it's Gold Rider Leyland Cypress. But when you go and visit your full service garden store, you will find a variety of these plants. You can also use them in your arrangements. Some of the bigger ones, you can snip branches and use them in your flower arranging to add extra color even indoors. Look at this great color. Pansies and violas can be planted in the fall, sometimes even in the warm winter, even in the spring. So remember, there's plants that you can use, even including annuals during the summer. Just imagine beautiful coleus planted in the garden and in your containers. And I really like flowers that are showy. And then if you look closely at these pansies, you can see the vibrance and the difference within each and every flower. Always mass or mass of color, as you see behind me here, really gives you a lot of impact in a garden. But just imagine you creating your own little place just like this, sitting in these chairs in the evening and just enjoying all the color that abounds around you. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Our Pearl of Wisdom this week tells us, life is kind of like a book. Some chapters are sad, some are happy, and some exciting. But if you never turn the page, you'll never know what the next chapter holds. Oh, so true. Remember, you can catch our show on demand anytime you like, even from your tablet computer at the beach this summer. Check it out at virginiafarming.com. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming.
Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they worked so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Hi, I'm Jeff Ishy, And I'm Amy Rocher with Virginia Farming. We'd like to invite you to become more involved with the show by submitting your own video reports. If you're involved with a non-commercial organization such as Young Farmers, FFA, a county farm bureau, or perhaps a, a commodity organization associated with Virginia agriculture, you can submit your own video report to be considered for our program. Video reports should be 60 to 90 seconds and recorded in high definition. It's simple. Just use your smartphone set on 1080p at 30 frames per second. Always, always shoot in the horizontal mode and keep the background noise down if possible. And the file format should be MOV or MP4. And then just send us a link so we can download it here at our studios. It's just that easy. In 60 to 90 seconds, tell us what's going on with your organization and how it relates to Virginia agriculture. Contact us about specific video requirements at our website, virginiafarming.com. We look forward to seeing your video reports on Virginia Farming.